Let's be in prayer together, folks. We do, God, give you great thanks for this opportunity to be together, uh, to be joined together through the uh, wonder of modern technology across the many, many miles that we're covering. And for this occasion, when we'll consider some painful history in our in this nation, addressing the original sin of racism and all that it has meant and the pain that it has caused over the centuries, but also to look to the future for ways that we might continue to address this sin and work to address, to alleviate it as well. We pray for wisdom, understanding, and open hearts, as well as open minds. Be with George, the presenters, and the panelists as they share their thoughts and express their deepest concern. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. With that, George, we turn to you. Okay. Well, this is really uh, exciting to be together with uh, so many of you from, personally, from so many parts of my life, uh, past and present and, and future, actually. <laughs> um, just a word about this presentation. It uh, emerged above all during a, a, about two years ago when I was uh, the uh, a visiting scholar at the College of Staten Island and it gave me an opportunity to uh, do a lot of reading about uh, race relations in the United States. And this is the result of really my own uh, attempt to make sense of where we are historically uh, in this country, uh, the, the very messy situation which we're in. And uh, I, I found out that, the, which you probably know anyway, is that you know, in our country we've been in messy situations often before. Uh, but uh, this is a kind of distillation of what uh, I found as I read. Uh, I'm joined uh, in terms of, of, of the readers uh, with this slideshow. By, uh, by Megan Hale <clears throat> and uh, Marissa Villarreal, uh, both members of the uh, steering committee of the New York chapter of MFSA. Um, many of you know Megan as the uh, executive of the uh, Deaconess Home Missioner Program and as the co-convener co of the Program Council of uh, MFSA nationally. Uh, and you may know uh, Marissa, a former member of the uh, staff of what was then the United Methodist Women. Uh, both of these two happened to be in Texas through the, the miracle of travel and technology and all. Uh, so we have a, a diverse uh, geographical presentation here. And so many, so happy to have so many of you from near and far uh, with us. So without any further ado, uh, I will we'll begin now. George, thank you so much for that presentation. Marisa, Megan, thank you for also um, helping to, to bring George's words to life for us tonight. Uh, now's the time when we are going to... So just as uh, people of conscience begin to understand that systemic racism continues to plague the United States, <clears throat> We're in a season of a fury of denial. Denial. States are passing laws that systemic racism cannot be taught, for instance. But why this angry backlash and attempts to unveil such formerly undertaught truth? Well, for one thing, this kind of rage is not new. It accompanies every surge in black advance, advancement in American history. To offer some historical perspective, we'd like to walk you through five periods in American history when there was and is particularly intense anger at the advancement of Americans of African descent. Our first look at a major surge forward in black life is at the revolutionary period when the rhetoric for freedom and liberty from oppression was all consuming. Scholars maintain that the revolutionary period actually witnessed two revolutionary struggles, one white 
against Britain and one black against enslavement. Those enslaved caught what one historian calls the aroma of freedom, but the enslaved understood liberty quite differently from white colonists. Our Methodist founder, John Wesley, scoffed at the Patriots claiming they were slaves of the Britain crown while actually enslaving black. On the promise of freedom, thousands fled to fight with the British and they proudly bore the word liberty. As, as the ideas of freedom and liberty spread across the colonies, increasing numbers of blacks stole away to emancipate themselves. Slave owners called them runaways and fugitives, but these escapees knew themselves as self-emancipators, risking everything for freedom. The evidence overall indicates that the primary reason for fleeing slavery is to find and be with loved ones. Black communities emerged with literary societies, mutual benefit societies, elegant Ethiopian balls, public processions, and special holidays like Pinkster pictured here. Religiously, something quite remarkable takes place. A new reformation, a black reformation, a dramatic religious fervor takes hold among blacks, which transforms the Christian religion of the slaveholder into a Christian religion of freed and hope to be freed enslaved people. Sometimes they steal away to secret, out of the way places to practice their faith. There they celebrated the biblical message in a new way. If God's almighty hand can lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, God can do the same with them. In this Black Reformation, a people propelled by their ancestral religious heritage of movement, song, and ecstatic devotion create out of their enslaved out of their slave master's faith, a profound spirituality that lives to this day. Early leaders among the new Methodist movement preached against slavery, like itinerant preacher Freeborn Gerritsen and Bishop Francis Asbury, accompanied by Black assistant Harry Hosier. Asbury wrote in his journal, if the Methodists will not emancipate their slaves, God will depart from them. The, the 1784 founding event of American Methodism mandated that all Methodists, laity as well as preachers, emancipate their slaves. But this search of assertiveness, this first reconstruction of Black life in America is not met with ferocious white rage resistance. While authorities, white authorities introduced new legal restrictions and harsher punishments in New York, Black, free, and slave are prohibited from being on the streets after dark. The penalty was a mandated whipping. Mobs often attacked free Black communities. When the small Black vote began to matter, it is stripped away with property-owning qualifications. In New York County, for example, by 1826, there were only 16 Black voters left. Former slave owners adamantly demanded the return of their so-called, quote, property. Slave catchers roamed the land, getting rich of the re-enslaving African-Americans. War hero George Washington set the tone for this anger when he could not recover his slaves who had escaped during the revolution and gone to Canada. Early Methodist zeal for racial Inclusivity quickly waned. Methodist Bishop Asbury himself retreated from insisting Methodists emancipate their slaves. Many African Americans broke off from the original Methodist body and formed their own denominations. Prominent leaders, even in the North, promoted the big lie that Blacks were inherently inferior. Their, quote, solution was ethnic cleansing send them, quote, back to Africa. The influential African Colonization Society had the support of John Jay and Abraham Lincoln and various Methodist leaders. But the river of freedom continued to flow. In spite of white rage, the black community developed networks of institutions and built a tradition of public protest that inspired generations of black activists and white abolitionists. Unyielding determination kept alive the yearning for freedom. 
The term reconstruction was originally applied to the dozen years following the Civil War. The emphasis has been on what was done for freed black people across the slave states. What this glosses over is the critical role that blacks played, the initiative they took in the entire process of abolishing slavery from the United States. By war's end, nearly a million black people, fully a quarter of all the slaves in the South had voted with their feet as it were for the Union by flocking to the Union lines. When Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, he simply gave a name to a process already in motion. Black volunteers eventually made up 10% of the Union Army, even including some volunteers from Africa. White supremacist textbooks contend that the years of Reconstruction were a disaster. The truth is that for Blacks, the years following the Civil War were ones of enormous hope and profound achievement. For instance, there were 2,000 Black elected official, I mean, uh, office holders, including two U.S. senators and 16 congressmen, uh, 16 congressmen, some of whom are pictured here. In cooperation with Northern religious bodies and the Freedmen's Bureau, African Americans established 500 schools. For instance, Rust College was founded in 1866 in a Methodist church basement in Holly Springs, Mississippi. An explosion of new hope. Here's a summary of this new hope embodied in the Reconstruction period. But yet again, Black advancement was countered by white rage. Briefly, there had been hope for some kind of restitution for 250 years of free backbreaking labor. General, General William T. Sherman had promised 40 acres and a mule, but after Lincoln's assassination, the new president, Andrew Johnson, a white southerner, immediately reneged. With no resources, blacks were forced into sharecropping. Fewer than one out of five sharecroppers ever made a profit. The rest were bound to the land, often to their former owners. The, unregen the unregenerate white power structure seethed to, the, to, see black to see Blacks making a life in freedom. To counter Black advancement and participation in public life, white supremacists used economic pressure, assaults, arson, and lynching to intimidate Black citizenry. The Ku Klux Klan and other terrorist bodies like the Knights of the White Camellia and the White Brotherhood were the most ferocious against, the, against agents of white rage. More genteel but just as insidious, scholars spun theories about the inherent inferiority of African descendants. Meanwhile, theologians promulgated junk theology that justified segregation and white supremacy in biblical terms. As soon as federal troops were pulled back by a weary and divided North, Blacks were driven from office and Black codes harshly circumscribed Black life. White supremacists promoted the myth of the lost cause, claiming their insurrection was really a war of Northern aggression with ubiquitous monuments and courthouse squares. They memorialized these insurrectionists as noble patriots. Gradually, the framework of Jim Crow laws and customs created an iron tight system of racial apartheid. It would have a 70 year legal strang stranglehold of, these, of the fate of the Southern blacks. Segregation's ludicrous extremes required even separate Bibles to swear on in court. If African Americans would even be allowed to testify. Historians have given the term the nader to the period 1890 through 1930, the lowest extended point in African-American fate. By 1900, the black voting rolls in Louisiana had fallen from 130,000 to 1,342. Yet through it all, black folks survived, in some ways thrived, thanks to dark determination, profound faith in a God who is a liberating God. In 1905, the NAACR was founded. God's, seed were, God's seeds were planted that will eventually sprout and grow. And Blacks 
prepare for the next major surge forward. And forward meant north and west. This era has been called the biggest underreported news story of the 20th century. At the dawn of that century, 90% of African Americans lived in the South. But beginning of about 1915, a stream of millions moved out of the South to the North and the Far West. Above all, they were seeking to escape the South's stranglehold of segregation, stranglehold of segregation, militant white supremacy, and the ever-present threat of lynching, cobbling together every penny of savings, Southern Blacks jam railroad stations heading to cities north and west. Ford Motor Company and other companies needed workers and some offer equal pay, where in a day they could, they could earn what they might get in a week back home. Many went by car. Going north meant the chance to get a decent education, to build a career, to explore a profession. From a little town near Selma, Alabama, a young woman went north to study music in Boston. This woman, Coretta Scott, happened to meet a theological student by the intriguing name of Martin Luther King Jr. He was studying at the Methodist Boston University School of Theology. Over the decades, decades, six million Black Americans from the South moved North, with sometimes 10,000 arriving in Chicago in a given month. These migrants and their children immeasurably enrich American life, giving us the likes of James Baldwin and Maya Angelou. It was these exiles and their children who gave birth to so much of the 20th century culture, Louis Armstrong, Miles Davis, Ella Fitzgerald. This dramatic migration changed the face of cities of the North and West and the equality of Black life. The Harlem resistance of the 1920s and the 1930s charted new paths that immeasurably enriched American life for everybody in the fields of music, dance, art, fashion, literature, theater, and politics. But again, this era of reconstruction was met with white resistance and rage. The North and West did not put out the welcome mat. While the auto provided new measures of freedom for African Americans, automobile travel was a perilous adventure. To eat, sleep, and get gasoline were major challenges, secured only through listings in the annual Green Book. And the facilities were all too often quite inferior. Perhaps most damning was the refusal of the white supremacist North to allow these freedom-seeking migrants to live wherever they could afford to. This control was often exercised by acts of violence and intimidation. As an example, already in 1905, 18, I mean, just eight miles from where I was born, white vigilantes, vigilantes in rural Adams County, Indiana, had violently chased out the few blacks in the county seat town. The term sundown town refers to signs posted at the edge of many communities warning blacks not to be in town after sundown or else. Not far from my birthplace, I grew up in Fort Wayne, an industrial city where all the blacks were crowded into the inner city. While all the towns and, and counties surrounding it were sundown counties, those are the ones in the dark shaded. This pattern developed everywhere in the North. Freedom and job-seeking Black families were crowded into the least desirable, most crowded parts of cities. There were not only sundown towns and counties, but sundown cities, sundown neighborhoods, and eventually sundown suburbs. The planned suburb Levittown, shown here, excluded Blacks and also Jews, although the developer, Sidney Levitt, was himself Jewish. 
And just as the Great Migration began, the dormant Ku Klux Klan was reorganized. In the 1920s, it boasted a membership of 4 million who marched, rallied, burned crosses, and bombed and torched churches and schools to intimidate not only Blacks, but also Catholics, Jews, immigrants, and labor activists. This young woman was murdered for selling encyclopedias in a white Southern Indiana neighborhood, Carol Jenkins. Enraged racists terrorized Blacks living in Northern cities like the infamous Tulsa Race Massacre just over a hundred years ago. It wiped out a thriving, successful Black community with firebombing, killing 300. National, Carsmen, National Guardsmen themselves torched a Black church. In shame, newspaper accounts of the massacre were cut out before being microfilmed, before being microfilmed trying to bury the memory. But still, despite white rage, violence, and intimidation, Black Americans made a way out of no way, made enormous strides, and laid the groundwork for a new, far-reaching surge in the 1950s and 60s. A new sense of pride and possibility was encapsulated by the term, the new Negro. The contours of the fourth era of Black Reconstruction and white rage are far more familiar to us its goal was to tear down the legal barriers of racial segregation and assure their enforcement. Inaugurating this era were the brilliant Supreme Court arguments by NAACP legal defense fund lawyers led by Thurgood Marshall. This resulted in the 1954 Supreme Court decision outlawing segregated schools. Equally dramatic was the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott in 1955 organized initially by the Women's Political Caucus. Some 50,000 disciplined Black citizens created a springboard for a remarkable era. Then there was the 1960 lunch counter sit-in by four freshmen at North Carolina a and Within 18 months, there had been 40,000 sit-ins with 3,000 arrested. The sit-in philosophy and tactics were perfected in Nashville by Methodist Reverend James Lawson. In solidarity, hundreds of thousands across the country picketed and boycotted Woolworths. The civil rights movement embraced direct confrontation, civil disobedience, mass action, and demands for federal intervention. Its accomplishments were broad ranging. As a kind of Shorthand, the movement tends to be reduced to certain milestones like the sit-ins, the Freedom Rides, the March on Washington, and the Selma to Montgomery Voting Rights Campaign. But these accomplishments were actually the work of hundreds of thousands, even millions, who pioneered new ways of being and thinking. Multitudes took risks they'd never taken before, thought of possibilities for a new freedom they had never taken seriously and began to live the interracial community they'd only been dreaming of. Let me use aspects of my own experience as an example. At the 1961 conference in North Carolina where sit-in veterans organized the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or SNCC, there were four white students from Union Theological Seminary in attendance. They felt challenged to discover their part as white seminarians. They went back to organize the student racial ministry, which placed seminarians in summer internships in churches of the other color, mostly in the South. I was sent to Birmingham in 1963. I was in awe that summer of the courage of my host pastor and his family. You can see Reverend Lindsay there in the middle with his wife next to him. They invited me to live with them after thinking it over carefully. Uh, in this city whose all too true nickname was Bombingham. I quickly learned that the all white police police were not our friends and that it was mind blowing to me and my naivete to discover that it was white people, not black people that I had to fear. Perhaps my signal achievement that summer was to organize an interracial summer college fellowship in that overall tense setting, we literally met underground in a church basement and eventually in background in backyards with high fences. Later on, we tested whether local restaurants would obey the law and serve all races. 
Similarly to today, numerous religious, educational, and community organizations started interracial projects. As an example, the National Methodist Student Movement hired a Black teammate and myself to visit Methodist campus ministries to promote racial integration. In all, we visited 40 campuses in eight states. We interrupted our travels to assist the Selma voting rights campaign, spending 18 days there. Every day we marched, as in the photo, to the courthouse to protest black voter intimidation. I'm in the second row on the right, just behind the nun. My teammate Otis is in the second row in the middle. We brought dozens of Methodist students to Montgomery to organize housing in black homes for the thousands coming down for the final triumphal entry into George Wallace's Capitol grounds in Montgomery. But as always, black advancement is met with white supremacist rage. Southern cities and colleges revolted against integration. Authorities closed public schools to avoid integration. New laws to protect voting rights and public accommodations were undermined in every possible way. Actually, it was violent rage that took me south in the first place. Just after the movement won a measure of desegregation in, Bir in Birmingham, white supremacists bombed a Birmingham motel intending to kill Martin Luther King. This was the event that yanked me out of my moral sleep. Hundreds of homes and churches were bombed. One night toward the end of this, my summer in Birmingham, the home of Black Birmingham civil rights lawyer Arthur Shores was, was bombed for the second time. The next morning, Pastor Lindsay and I went to share the anger and despair. This is what we saw. The violence of white rage that touched me most was the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church just a couple of weeks after I returned to seminary. My connection was that professional photographer Chris McNair had taken the picture of the vacation church school that I had organized that summer in Birmingham. His daughter, Denise, was one of the four young girls killed. In most communities, folks of color have been touched by this white rage. Two examples from Staten Island, where I live. This sign has been besmirched numerous times. And in the 1990s, the KKK was organized here on Staten Island. And as you may know, government action was also based on white rage. The war on drugs entrapped millions of minorities and gave rise to the incredible level of mass incarceration, which Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow. But despite resistance and rage, the river of freedom widened and deepened. Black and brown people moved into leadership in numerous fields. Denise McNair's father, Chris, became one of the first black members of Alabama's legislature since the 1870s. And this river carried, this river carried with it advances for women, the Latinx community, persons with handicaps, Asian Americans, and the LGBTQIA community. The next major surge is actually our time. One might date the beginning of this fifth era in 2008, called the remarkable election of the first black president, Barack Obama, in American history. New generations of activists, scholars, athletes, local neighborhoods, and cultural leaders insisted that white supremacy still ruled and needed to be exposed and overcome. Let's look at some of the examples of these fresh responses over this period. For instance, Name changes like Tulsa Race Riot to Tulsa Race Massacre. Religious and community groups are being challenged to look more deeply. For example, we look to Robert, Robin DiAngelo to help us confront our white fragility. Carol Anderson help us to uncover white rage. Ibram Candy instruct us on how to be an anti-racist. Ijoma Olu is tutoring us about guilt and microaggression. More and more schools are including people of color in their history and other courses. The New York Times in 1619 project has become a major resource. Historians and journalists are uncovering new dim dimensions of the history of Black 
indigenous and people of color. One historian is spending a night in as many slave cabins as he can find. The Washington professional football team finally was forced to drop its team's name, Redskins. The WNBA league dedicated its season to Breonna Taylor, a black woman killed by police in her home. Virginia's governor ordered removal of a gigantic statue of Robert E. Lee in Richmond, Virginia, one of 230 Confederate memorials and symbols removed thus far, though some 2000 still remain. HBO Max removes the classic racist film, Gone with the Wind from its catalog. Quaker Oats finally drops the Aunt Jemima name of its pancake products. Art museums are revamping their leadership and their exhibitions. Churches and universities are being pressed about their historical complicity with racism and to make reparations. And true to the historical pattern, we should not be surprised that this current dramatic era of reconstruction for black indigenous and people of color would be met with another season of white rage. Such rage is exploding all around us. Every means was employed to undermine President Obama's credibility and demean him as a person. White supremacists promoted the big lie that he really wasn't born in the United States. Opposition leaders viewed, um, or rather vowed, to oppose everything that he would propose. As you know, a successor was elected with the slogan, Make America Great Again, which signaled the wish to, restore, to return to the 1950s and earlier when Jim Crow predominated and white men were in total control. With the votes of people of color becoming decisive in elections, white supremacists have intensified their efforts to suppress voting in the very cities and areas where blacks have been forced uh, into how, by house, forced into by housing discrimination. Gerrymandering election districts is a particularly egregious form of this. These are two congressional districts in North Carolina. The lead writer of the 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah-Jones, was denied tenure at the University of North Carolina by a state oversight agency. Finally, white supremacy continues to employ the big lie that the 2020 presidential election was stolen. Trump himself launched the January 6th insurrection as a last ditch effort to keep a white supremacist misogynist in power. And as Christians, we should be particularly embarrassed by the heresy of Christian nationalism that blends white supremacy, Christian theology, super nationalism, and the glorification of demagogues. To summarize, a defining characteristic of American history is recurring eras of black reconstruction and white rage. Black Americans, slave or free, have surged forward in particularly dramatic ways in these five eras and dreamed new dreams and fought for an inclusive commonwealth. Our time is such a period of both reconstruction and reactionary rage. I want to emphasize in closing that for all the rage of resistance, it cannot ultimately stop the forward movement of the river of justice. The river is broader than ever, now empowering Blacks and Indigenous and people of color and the LGBT communities and women as well. Even in our time when human hope sometimes seems to be in short supply, I'm hopeful. I believe God is working in our history and hopefully we are committed to working in God's history. As Dr. King said, the arc of history is long but it bends at the elbow toward justice. To turn to our panel um, responses to, to the presentation, um, which I hope has stirred up questions and insights in you as well, and that you'll share those in the chat so that we can, um, we can answer your questions and respond to your thoughts as well. Uh, our three responders are myself, 
Um, I am the pastor at New Paltz United Methodist Church. Um, and prior to my time in the clergy, I worked for the ACLU um, and in, in legislative work. Um, our second respondent is Reverend Herman Darden, a longtime pastor in the New York Annual Conference, a former district superintendent, and I believe that you are, I should refer to you as the recently retired Reverend Herman Darden. Congratulations. As well as our own Ann Craig, a longtime member of MFSA here in New York, a longtime member of my, my home church, New Paltz United Methodist Church, a Methodist for life, and a frequently elected representative to General Conference. Um, so uh, I, I, I will confess that we got to see this pre the words of this presentation before, and I, I had such a great time um, being in conversation with your work, George. So thank you. Um, one of the, the first things that really um, I think is important for us to grapple with is the idea, the reality that the South in particular was never a democracy. It was always meant to be a, a sort of oligarchy. Um, and, and so any, it, it's not bewildering um, when you begin to, to reckon with that, that there's this move away from democracy now um, based upon racism. Uh, and the other is that the, the Civil War, um, I believe is still ongoing. I think that we've been in a Cold War this entire time. Um, and, and so, um, there have been spikes in which that war has has come to blows, but um, it's never it's never ended. Uh, I think it's really interesting how Methodist apologetics for slavery are as old as Methodism. Um, you know, George Whitfield was a staunch supporter of slavery, and um, he falls into a, a theological legacy that we're still contending with. Um, a, a know your place theology that um, that is supported by and upholds empire. Um, and in that way, it could be argued that George Whitfield is our Methodist shame. Um, freedom and liberty, these early white Americans um, develop a very particular theological lens to support their racism, their abuses. Um, they perceive themselves as a new Jerusalem um, and themselves, therefore, as the chosen of God, making their actions acceptable. And, and I, I, I suppose I'm being nitpicky, but I, I was pondering the idea that the enslaved create out of their slave master's faith a new spirituality. But what if, in fact, um, we were to say that they saw through the evil interpretations of slave master faith of, you know, um, we should call them what they were. They were terrorists and um, jailers of forced labor camps. Um, and, and so in what way might we look at the enslaved as liberating the, the, the beliefs of Jesus um, and, and rescuing Jesus from those who he would certainly stand in opposition to. Um, and, you know, how interesting that Asbury himself specifically suggests that, um, that God would depart from whites if they did not repent of their slavery. And yet it's still unthinkable in most white church settings to suggest that God might turn away our all loving God could never turn away, not from us, surely. Nice Jesus, white Jesus forgives all, even potentially the unforgivable. And yet that's not necessarily the God that we see in our texts. Uh, Reconstruction is portrayed as a sort of largesse of Northern whites in most of our, our textbooks and our, our collective understanding, rather than um, as the, the incredible bravery of Black people um, standing up to terrorism, systemic legal terrorism. Um, and 
you know, how we talk about these, how we begin to change our terms is also an act of liberation. Um, turning plantations into forced labor camps, slave catchers into kidnappers. Um, the, the language we use as it changes helps to unearth our history. Um, also, the, the notion that, that, um, that white supremacists are, are bad apples rather than this deeply rooted system of whiteness. Um, that the very nature of our democracy, our nation, is founded upon um, breaking the backs of others to benefit ourselves. Without blackness, there is no whiteness. And we still have the junk theology that was born of Whitfield, of Calvin, of empire. Um, and in fact, one could argue that that is precisely what has just broken our own United Methodist Church. Um, as the, as we move into the third era, um, it, it's interesting that we forget that the, the KKK also hated Catholics, Jews, immigrants, and unions. And the fact that we can forget that shows the power of white supremacy. White people cannot bear to be so associated with the history of black people. And so this move happens where, um, all of the attention gets focused in one direction. The Tulsa massacre alone destroyed the equivalent of $200 million in property. If that money had been kept in the community, it would be billions, billions of dollars just from Tulsa now. Um, I've started to think of the civil rights movement as the nonviolent revolution, um, as soldiers returning from World War II begin to develop and employ military tactics and discipline to the training of protesters and, and pair powerfully with clergy. And I, I wonder what that might offer to us in these times for how we would like to organize ourselves. And also, George, I want to thank you for your service in the nonviolent revolution because um, it, I do believe you were, you were a soldier in uh, our greatest war. Um, it, it also begs the question what we should perceive our role as Christians um, to be in the in the ongoing struggle today. And how do we reconcile George's service with the fact that the white church abandoned the black church in that moment when the the requests, the demands became specific. And what does that say about how the white church at large felt about George's work too? I love the moment that we're in because I love the way that it reframes racism um, rather than it being a, 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 a thing that we need to address to make space for Black people into uh, a shifting of responsibility where it really belongs. It's a beautiful opportunity for actual, actual repentance. And yet I fear that we might lose the moment in, um, through cancel culture. You know, the, we remove statues, but we don't reframe them. And so how are we helping a, a system to whitewash itself and perpetuate um, convenient forgetting? It's not surprising that regressionists and racists and their unwitting followers would rather destroy democracy than dismantle racism. Democracy doesn't pay. Racism is profitable. And we may well be about to see the Civil War come back to blows. Those were my thoughts after spending some time with George's words and um, now I'm very curious to hear what Reverend Herman Darden's thoughts and observations are. Well, first, I want to thank George for this presentation. Uh, it's very timely. Uh, I, have, I have questions, uh, and, I, and let me just read the question. Uh, the church, the mainline Protestant denominations have followed the pattern of the general society with reference to this ebb and flow of racial progress. How does this current era 
of separation and disaffiliation fit with the historical pattern that you've outlined? Shall I ask all the questions at one time? Maybe I will, yes. My second question would be, uh, what are the lessons that we should teach our children, particularly our, our, our teenagers, about how to mitigate the racist historical pattern that is that doesn't exist simply on a national level, but we can find in our communities, uh, in our neighborhoods, uh, uh, in in the public in the school system, uh, when there's a surge of black population, there's a reaction to that, even amongst young people. Uh, what are the lessons that we need to teach so that they can learn uh, differently? And uh, my last question is a very simple one. Is it possible for this presentation to be given to the New York Annual Conference? I think everybody needs to hear this. Thank you, Herman. I think um, perhaps the best way to go about that is to have those be uh, some of the first questions that we answer in our Q&A time. And Thank you. And just a, a long list of people, you know, starting with George and Lemon, your leadership and, and the presentation of Megan and Marisa and, and uh, Reverend Herman Darden your incisive questions and that lead us into the future. Just really appreciate all of that. Um, my, um, my time I, is a little more confessional, a little more autobiographical. Um, and I can really relate to George uh, in terms of, you know, spending a lifetime thinking about race. Um, you know, I was, shaped in the cauldron of watching the early watching the news uh, as children were posed uh, and churches were burned and bombed. I was like six, but it was like just completely uh, riveting to me as a six-year-old watching the news uh, and changed my life. So my uh, currently uh, there's you know, there's a million stories over the years, but the current story that I think really kind of informs my thinking right now and uh, my partnership with anyone who's trying to do this, any white person who's trying to do this work, uh, uh, my sister and I are starting in on a book uh, and we wanna call it something like Good Girls. Uh, raised ra confessions of, girl, of women raised in a white supremacist world um, and how we were shaped by the racial ideology over the, the decades of our lives and, um, and, the, and the points of when we resisted it, the points when we were brought to heal um, and, and I look at the current reality of the politics of this country, and that was very, uh, very profound women of grace, you know, that, that currently we would rather destroy democracy than actually uh, challenge racist systems. Uh, that's exactly where we are. And um, so as, as I look around, you know, Marisa and I moved to uh, Texas, to be with family, to retire. Uh, and Texas has no corner on racism, but I feel fear. I feel fear here in a way that I didn't quite feel it in New York, even rural New York. Uh, so there is, there is this propaganda, there is uh, political, political terrorism to make sure, you know, I'm a white person. And I feel frightened, you know. Uh, I can only imagine people of color, um, yeah, the kind of insidious fear that begins to seep in. It's like, how do I stay safe? Um, so there's so much work to do. Um, and it, I, I, 
look forward to, and I so value, you know, these, the partnerships, uh, both within uh, communities of white resistance to racism and crossing racial lines. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that I have appreciated about the United Methodist Church, it, the United Methodist Church is where I received initial uh, training on, on the beginnings of how to be non-racist or anti-racist. Um, the United Methodist Church provided context where I worked across racial lines on a daily basis. The United Methodist Church provided context where uh, services were provided across racial lines, all in the, the same time having to always look where race was at work and how the history of like the community centers uh, that serve different communities. You'd have the Bethlehem Center, the B for Black, uh, and you'd have the Wesley Centers, W for White, and who was deemed white and who was deemed Black. Uh, you know, these codes that, that were built into church realities. So uh, 22 years in, you know, General Board of Global Ministries, you know, you see how the race gets played out and, and in staffing and in, um, you know, just the day-to-day, -day. although it's the place that, uh, that has given me the opportunity to learn and to cross racial boundaries, it is also a place, as you laid out very importantly, as sort of a, a having roots both in resistance to slavery as well as roots in, you know, collapsing into supporting slavery without much effort. Um, so I think that's enough said for now. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, Herman, again, George. Um, and now is the time when we, um, we answer some of your questions. George, how do you feel about starting with Herman's questions? Uh, I'll take I'll take the first one anyway. Um, Herman, you you raise very poignant questions. Uh, the one about uh, the the ambiguously ambiguous history of Methodism uh, in relationship to to race. Um, it's entirely through our 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 DNA in a way that we 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 waffle. We are divided. We have outstanding spokespersons on on both sides. Uh, you know, of course, the the uh, Methodist Church split in what, around 1840 over over slavery. Uh, that didn't mean that the Northern Church was uh, was pro abolitionist. Uh, there were a lot of attempts to try to keep that kind of talk uh, suppressed. Um, I cut my teeth on. Uh, studying the uh, structural uh, segregation in the Methodist Church in, in terms of the central jurisdiction. That's what I wrote my college uh, history thesis on. And uh, our denomination, whatever name it's taken over, over the years, um, for me has been a, a place where I've grown and been challenged. Uh, in fact, I was, you know, as I said, I was, I, I was employed by by the Methodist student movement to 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 work against racism, uh, and yet it's this the place where you know right now we're we're splitting again over what I think underneath it all is the same kind of issue, mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, I guess I I take hope in the the notion of the faithful remnant, you know that that be, because there were a, a few. Who were faithful? God preserved the the larger institution, and maybe that's why we 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 still are lasting. But uh, it's 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 very vexing. I agree. Thank you. That's uh, very vexing. Is one of the the most polite ways to put it I have ever heard, George. Well done. <laughs> 
<laughs> maddening. How about that? Whatever. <laughs> Um, I, I, I happen to notice in the chat because I'm I am starting to monitor for all of your questions. You guys can throw them on in there, really, truly, you can. Um, uh, I, I I knew that I would touch a nerve when I brought up the the monuments. And to clarify, I'm not saying that all of those monuments should stay. I'm not saying that most of those monuments should stay. I'm not necessarily saying that any of them should stay. What I am saying is that if we don't, as it was in the chat, the find new ways to confront and challenge rather than hide our racist past. We will never really move beyond it. And, and so um, to take them down without careful consideration, to not um, make some other object lesson in its place where we can tell a different story, that that is what concerns me. I, I I hope that clarifies. I'm not actually loving Robert E. Lee statues. Um, uh, Anne, you're uh, one piece I wanted to touch on, which is related to this, and that is, you know, it, as we begin to like grasp the you know the tendrils that just pervade. Uh, the culture, uh, you know, I've, a really good resource that I, I recently read was a book called uh, by David Korn called uh, American Psychosis, um, and it could just as well have been uh, have been titled American Rage, you know, or White Rage or some variation on that because it tracks how political conservatives you know, and of both stripes along the way, but mostly in most recent decades, Republicans, how they have leaned heavily on racism to get what they want done and to get elected, which is what they want done. So it's, uh, you know, the pervasiveness and the systemic character and the people who like really didn't want to do this, you know, didn't want to have the KKK, but then did it. You know, it's just over and over and over again. It's just so deeply just pervasive. Thanks, Anne. Um, George, I, I see a question in the in the um, chat about how we make change within ourselves, um, in particular, how we actually um, become more like you. Uh, to make a difference within ourselves and our workplaces, our churches, and within our societies. And I'm wondering, uh, first, George, and then I guess any of our respondents, what your thoughts are on that. What occurs to me is the doctrine of Christian perfection, that we're never there, and but we continually strive for that. Uh, when I think of uh, what my worldview when I was involved in the civil rights movement in the, in the 60s. Uh, at that point, the, the effort was to just get rid of, of legal segregation. Uh, and the, the deep questions about a, race to, a thoroughly racist society, about white privilege, were pretty much fringe questions. Uh, the black power began to raise some of these questions, but you know the the current reconstruction is raising really really deep questions that I think are 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 a gift. Uh, I mean to think about about our own uh, pr uh, privilege, you know, to realize that in uh, eighteen fifty, my my great grandfather. Uh, claimed land in Indiana one year after a new constitution in the state of Indiana was adopted that said no Negroes there there live there come into the state anymore. So the, 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 the land that, that my grand forefathers, you know, have farmed was land that black people couldn't access. Absolutely. I had never been aware of things like that. Uh, and I think, uh, I just think we need to, to be looking deeper and deeper. I think people like uh, Carol Anderson and so forth really help us uh, 
by raising these questions. And uh, I think we just have to, uh, you know, fall on our on our faces and, and 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 say, "Oh Lord, help! You know, help help us, teach us." Uh, here we come, just without one plea, you know. Um, but see ourselves as works in, pro in progress uh, toward Christian perfection, toward a anti-racist sense of being. And from what uh, Kendry says, you know, that's, that's a task of people of all backgrounds and races. Amen to that. Um, Herman, Anne, do you have any, any thoughts to add to that? And one of the things that I, questions I have, uh, and it's for some white people, is how do you get past the uh, notion, the obsession, the glorification of being white? How do you get past all that is taught to you from infancy about being white? How do you work against that? How do you identify it? How do you begin to sort it out? How do you begin to identify what is healthy and what is not healthy about being a white person? Does anyone really enter into that kind of uh, self-analysis? That's what my sister and I are starting in on. And when she, when she came up with, she came up with the idea. And I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, it, I'm like, really? Okay. Um, and I was like, well, let's, let's put our, you know, put our feet in the water and see how, see how it goes. And, you know, we're starting to write. And, you know, it is, it, you know, it's this dance between uh, this sense of, ironically, feeling somewhat superior because we're white people asking these questions. You know, there's plenty of irony there, you know, and and while at the same time feeling the shame of, uh, you know, being sold to Billy Goods and bought it, you know, despite all of the, the anti-racist work, there still is that deep level of like, no, that's white superiority, you know, and so, you know, kind of, you know, being the resistor, but being honest is, uh, I don't, I guess really, uh, Herman, I don't, I don't know, but I'm trying to find out. Uh, that's all I could say to that important question. Um, uh, you know, Herman, I spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, uh, and I think step one is, teaching critical thinking, um, which sounds very like sanitized, but that, that's, not, that's not how I mean it. Um, I think that as, a, as, a, as an American culture um, bent toward um, making white people happy, <laughs> um, we have stopped teaching critical thinking. We've st we don't want to think critically because it's painful and frightening um, and causes us to challenge these, these assumptions that we've held un almost unconsciously. Um, and, and yet once we can begin to explore critical thinking, then we can help walk people into places that seem more frightening. Um, and when you put critical thinking with Jesus, <laughs> you, you've got a pretty, a pretty potent set of bookends there to hold people up um, while, they, while they do this work. Um, but that doesn't make it easy or not exhausting at times to, to, do, to do the work. Um, Megan, Bob, am I am I missing questions? I, I, I might have missed a couple. There was a question 
earlier uh, about the where do we see the elements of white nationalism in our denomination of the United Methodist Church and within the Global Methodist Church, newly formed Global Methodist Church? Where do we, or how pervasive are they, or where do we see these elements of white nationalism, and um, how can we work against that or for change? Don't all jump in at once. I do think that that you know it's there. It's uh, it's like most white racism today is uh, implicit, insidious, um, and perpetrated by, as we titled our book or entitling our book, "Good People," um, and so you've got all of those dynamics. And you also have generally, the people are uh, trying to make their living doing church work. And so if you push too hard, you will be shown the door. And so um, those are all real factors. So um, it's like, who is it in the church? I, I think it's that, that critical thinking that Lemon and Grace mentioned. It's like, who is it that you want to push? I think it's important to be tactical, strategic uh, and analytical about what are you doing, you know, and why are you doing it? Um, so I don't think there's a simple answer. You know, there are a lot of different people in power. Um, people use power in a lot of different ways and it's not, you know, not necessarily only white people who use power in negative ways. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a lifelong challenge and a lifelong journey. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. Um, uh, we've got a, a question uh, specifically for George on how, um, on what value and impact um, your time in the student interracial ministry uh, has had on your life and how does that, how might that inform us today? Well, it set my life on the trajectory that it's been. You know, it was was uh, revolutionary, and what I what that's what I experienced through the through the Methodist student movement, actually, and then through the student racial ministry uh, as well. And it seems like, at least from my experience, it's it's being given new kinds of experiences that offer new perspectives than, than what I had grown up with that is, is, is critical. And it seems like at its best, what we as a church offer are uh, new kinds of experiences that, that stretch us, that in ways contradict maybe assumptions that we've grown up with. Uh, and um, I just wish that, that, that every every congregation, you know, the, the, the life of the congregation was ex seeking these experiences and, and, uh, and looking at them through, the, through a the theological lens and, and understanding, you know, how the domination system is at work all around us and that, uh, that somehow the, the gospel undermines that, enables us to see things with, the, with, with new lenses. Uh, when I was in the, in the Wesley Foundation, uh, active in that uh, Methodist student movement as a college in college, there was a, something called the Christian Citizenship Seminar uh, each year, and they gathered about fifty or sixty of us from different parts of the country, and, uh, and we spent five days in at, at the UN and five days in Washington. Um, in my time, you know, we met Eleanor Roosevelt, for instance. Uh, we had a Japanese meal at a time when you hardly knew that you could get that. We went to the original cast uh, performance of a West Side Story. Uh, th these things were very eye-opening for people like me. And, uh, you know, the equivalent exists today. Uh, and I, I just wish that that were 
so much the fiber of what what congregational life was a lot was like put us in new situations with new people and new ideas and and uh, new possibilities and new new sense of open our eyes of justice in new ways well and I, you know as you were speaking george i had to wonder it might it be that part of um part of what happened was that you you the more involved you became, the less it felt like you were giving something up from separating yourself from white supremacy because you had built this other faith and cultural family around yourself that was, you know, richer, deeper, more nuanced. And, and so, you know, the further up and further in, the more, you, the more you, the more you traveled, um, the more you were able to to travel. Um, I think that's right. And, you know, I think we, we can all find parts of our lives where the, the journey has led us in that way. And, and that's when, you know, the excitement that you that you read in the, in the Gospels and the epistles, you know, about uh, being set free and and the, the, the thrill of the, of the new life that one is stepping into uh, it comes as, a, as an exciting gift, not something that you're, you're really giving up, but you're, you're being blessed in new ways. Uh, I'd like for us to see our, our, our journey in those exciting ways. Uh, we have a really, I, I think, super interesting question. Um, I, Isaiah, I don't know. I feel like maybe you and I should have coffee or something because I want to. I want to wrestle with all of these same questions. Um, how do we defend ourselves from the growing uh, white militia movement um, and and their increasing armament and militant and um, is our responses like uh, the the new Black Panthers, a rise of the Black Panthers again, um, and similar groups. Um, an appropriate response. Well, I felt like uh, your comment about the Civil War never having really gone away is very apropos. Uh, and when you look at who is armed right now, uh, you know, the white militia and the, the white supremacists, you know, are out there. And uh, so, and storming the national capital. So how we move forward, whether, whether progressives, anti-racists, you know, arm ourselves, whether people of color begin to arm themselves, you know, it's, it's, it was a question for Martin Luther King Jr. You know, it's like, how, who's gonna get killed uh, and what, what tactics, what strategies are going to sway the public? Uh, and I think those are the kinds of questions we need to ask ourselves too. Um, and yeah, so leave it that. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always heard that you cannot beat the devil at his own game. Uh, I don't think uh, arming oneself to go against a well-armed, uh, 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 militia is a winning strategy. Uh, it's a losing strategy all around. But then again, there's a story of the deacons in Mississippi who were armed veterans who made it clear that they were going to defend Dr. King and those who worked with the civil rights movement. And when they made that clear and made their presence known, no one was attacked by the KKK nor or anyone else who's against what they were doing. So I think there's something to be said for strengthening your presence, but I don't know that armed conflict is the answer, not, not against the people who have, who literally worship guns and war. I, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I think that maybe the most important thing we can do is keep asking all of these questions. Um, because the answers might not always be the same, but the more we ask them, the better we'll be at finding the answers in a timely fashion. Um, it is, I'm keeping a, a, a track of our time. Are there any last thoughts before I turn it over to Ed to kind of 
put a put a bow on our time together. Uh, Limina, just a, uh, I see Ed's question about uh, looking at the histories of our own churches. I think that's very important. Uh, certainly here in our in our uh, New York conference, which is is an old one, uh, the the church that I served here on Staten Island, Bethel Church, I discovered uh, of the eight of eight of the thirteen people who are listed in old histories as the pillars of that church were were uh, slaveholders. Uh, that's here in New York City. Uh, I just think our New York conference needs to dig into these uh, our, our own history and, and other places across the country and and be uh, be really honest. Uh, just like many uh, educational universities are are looking at their own past, and um, so I I hope we we'll be doing that. That seems like a perfect uh, a perfect thing for folks to take back with them uh, tomorrow when they wake up to their uh, their home church. Um, Ed, I think uh, I think with that, we will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, oh, wow. What a rich time we have had together. Thank you so much, George, and uh, your co-readers, <laughs> Megan and Mar Marisa and uh, Reverend Limina and Reverend Herman and, and Anne, uh, thank you all for your incredibly uh, thoughtful responses. Um, Herman, I, I would, to answer one of your questions, I think we can explore making this available to the New York Annual Conference and any churches or individuals who would like uh, to see it. We'll, we'll look into that. I promise that we'll do that. And of all those wonderful uh, images that you presented, George, some harrowing some inspiring. Um, one of the ones that tickled the two of us the most was seeing George McLean in a suit and short hair, uh, walking <laughs> there, marching, <laughs> marching for justice. Yeah, and, and Selma. So thanks for and, and thanks for sharing your story as well, uh, friends. Thank you for your your observations and your. I'm sure we could have a fantastic discussion if we broke up into small groups now and had chats together and, and really, maybe we'll do that another time. So we invite you back for, to continue this discussion. We'll, we'll go back to our steering committee and think of some ways that we might. We have your names and your email addresses, so we'll get back to you um, in the future. And if you have any ideas for future programs or conversations like this, we'd just send them to us. We would love to hear from you and love to hear about them. If you'd like to be uh, a member of New York chapter of Methodist Federation for Social Action. We'd love that. Go to our Facebook page and you can see that. Or as, as Megan was suggesting before, if you live somewhere else, uh, find your local MFSA chapter or go to MFSA National and join there, become a member there, and you'll get uh, hopefully linked up with your uh, chapter group. Uh, so I think that kind of uh, means that we're at the end of our time together. And uh, so with that, I'm going to ask a limited grace to close us in prayer. Thanks, Ed. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for history and our ability to recall it, to recall your ancient history and to put it in conversation with our own more contemporary history. God, as we stir up our uncomfortable truths, help to remind us that Jesus too lived in a time of profoundly uncomfortable truths, and yet he not only walked into the storm of them, he did so with friends in solidarity over dinner. God, help us to fight for freedom and justice as Jesus did with a good meal and good company and always seeking to put your will first. Help us, God, to go to our rest this evening with our disquiet held 
in one hand and our knowledge of your grace in the other so that we might wake refreshed, renewed, and with more sense of purpose than we had yesterday. All this and so much more we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.